Chris Hansen, right now on Crime Watch Daily from here in New York City. Married to one man, but... Did your sister have a lot of affairs on him? Maybe two or three. And when she lures her secret lover to her house for sex, it'll be a date with death. You have a missing man, you have a love triangle. Right. The men around Kelly Cochran keep dropping like flies. We're County 911. He's bleeding barely. When her husband dies too... I knew that Kelly killed him. Today, Anna Garcia investigates a crazy field trip with police. You want pizza? She's eating pizza. A truly bizarre interrogation. You watched him die, right? Look at me. And the dogged police chief on a mission to outwit a black widow and solve a double murder mystery. I finally found you. And right now. Go, let's go. Jason Matera with Crime Watch Daily. I'm Michelle Sagona from Crime Watch Daily. This. Elizabeth Smart from Crime Watch Daily. It's Anna Garcia from Crime Watch Daily. You got anything to say? It's Crime Watch Daily. What do you mean you don't know she's 13? You're running away now? Welcome to Crime Watch Daily, everyone. I'm Chris Hansen. First up today, don't let this smile fool you. Behind the sheepish grin and thousand mile stare is a woman who police say is capable of just about anything. Anna Garcia has today's top story, love, marriage, and murder. A bizarre interrogation of a double murder suspect. I got two men dying there in two. I know that. A detective holding the hands of a cold-blooded killer. You watched him die, right? A crime so gory, it defies comparison. How did he cut him into pieces? It's It all started nearly two years earlier, deep in the woods of northern Michigan. A man disappears just before leaving for a new job. He vanished. Cops wonder, did he just up and go without saying goodbye? He either killed himself or just disappeared. Did he drown sailing on the lake? The water was up here. Or was he the victim of a possible serial killer? I felt that when I started with this case. Crime Watch Daily hits the ground with investigators combing the forest, searching for clues. This is the spot here. Do the fallen leaves tell the story of what happened to Chris Regan? Driving through the picturesque countryside of Michigan's Upper Peninsula, you can't help but think you're in the middle of nowhere. And you can't get much more isolated than the tiny town of Iron River. Iron River is a small town. Unfortunately, I have to label it as kind of a depressed community. Um, with a lot of problems. A lot of crime for a small town. But if you love the outdoors in icy cold winters like Chris Regan, Iron River is paradise. And it also didn't hurt that an old girlfriend, Terry O'Donnell, lived there. Chris and I started dating exclusively. We had planned a future together. We were planning on living together and moving to another area. So the next question is rather obvious. Were you in love? Yes. I, he swept me off my feet. Yeah. And, and I truly believe Chris loved me. But Terry says there was just one problem. I think he had just two sides of him. Terry says she discovered Chris's other side when she traveled overseas. He decided that he was going to um, hook up with other women while I was in England. He told me that didn't mean anything. It was just nothing. It was just sex? It was just sex. That had nothing to do with his love or our relationship. And I didn't understand that part. Terry claims Chris's roving eye led to their split. But she says, amazingly, they still remained friends. We talked all the time. We messaged each other all the time. Chris, an Air Force veteran studying for a business degree, decided to stay in Iron River and applied for a job at a local company that makes mining equipment. He went in and spoke to them about a job. <laughs> Much to my surprise, that was not the plan. So he gets a job there, mm -hmm. and that's where he meets Kelly Cochran. 
Kelly Cochran, a friendly young woman who apparently liked to swing both ways. Did he ever talk about Kelly? No. Um, we never talked about anybody else that we were dating. Chris wasn't dating Kelly. I think Chris and Kelly hooked up for sex, and that was it. He never went anywhere with her. He was never seen in public with her. Maybe that's because Chris's new girlfriend was already married. The only place they went was his apartment, and she was not to say anything about them hooking up. Chris rented a small apartment from Terry's parents right above their grocery store. And in the next town over, Kelly lived in this modest house with her husband, Jason. Kelly's younger brother, Colton, says they recently moved here from Merrillville, Indiana, not far from Chicago. Colton tells me he doesn't think Jason and Kelly were a good match. Colton, you got a look on your face. I actually said before they got married, but after they got engaged, that they shouldn't get married. They just didn't fit. He was a laid back guy. She was more of a go getter. Colton says Kelly's affair with Chris wasn't her first rodeo. Did your sister have a lot of affairs on him? Um, that I know of, maybe two or three. So he was jealous. He became jealous. But did Jason know that Kelly and Chris got together four or five times a week? Former Iron River Police Chief Laura Frizzo knows all the gossip in this town of 2800. Was she a married woman who was sneaking around, or did her husband know exactly what she was doing? He had said that he prior he had not been aware and that um, he didn't want to know about it. Jason was suicidal and was having emotional problems and whatnot, um, which again seemed to be stemming from her extramarital affairs, driving him crazy. But what was driving Jason's love rival, Chris, crazy was a bum knee. Even though Chris and Terry were no longer a couple, he kept this sticky note from her reminding him about a doctor's appointment, and he penned a cute response. Terry wrote this note for me after I had knee surgery. I love her. His job at Lakeshore was taking a toll on his knee because he was on his feet all day long at work, and so he needed a job also that wasn't so tough on his body. So Chris found a desk job all the way across the country in Asheville, North Carolina. He gave his two weeks notice at the plant where he and Kelly worked and started packing. He texted me that he was going the next day for his um, physical and drug test. And he told me once he got back from that, he would get in touch with me or we're, we were going to go out to celebrate his new job in North Carolina. Terry's dreams of moving with Chris to another place had melted like a spring thaw in Michigan. But did Kelly think she was the one who would be moving to Asheville with her lover? She did make it seem like they had this like lengthy romantic, you know, affair. And in fact, she even made mention that um, he wanted her to move with him out to North Carolina. So on one of Chris's last nights in Iron River, there was a first. Instead of Kelly coming over to his apartment, she invited him over to her house. She called Chris and she lured him over there for sex. Why would he go to her house if they had never before been to her house for sex? Apparently, Kelly made an offer he couldn't refuse. I'll cook you Italian for dinner and give you my body for dessert. Next. Did you ever see her with the lasagna? What happens when Chris hooks up with Kelly for a night of lust and lasagna? Chris Regan is an Air Force vet with an eye for the ladies. Unfortunately, that eye has focused on a married coworker. And when she suddenly invites him to her house for an intimate dinner, it appears something else is on the menu. Here's Anna Garcia. Chris Regan had just given two weeks notice at work. He was about to meet Kelly Cochran, his secret lover from the office for lasagna and maybe a little fooling around. His friend, Terry O'Donnell, says she never heard from him after that. I got really concerned and started asking um, people if they had seen him around. And one of the guys that he works with just assumed that he had left. He just didn't come back to work. Terry spent nearly two excruciating weeks with no word from Chris. 
Frantic and in full panic mode, she went to the apartment Chris rented from her parents. A shambles. It was a wreck. Stuff scattered everywhere. Dirty dishes all crusted in kitchen sinks. Red goo in the bottom of his wine glass. The windows were open. The apartment was cool. His medication was all there. I mean, he had it in there. He was gone. It's like he vanished. He vanished. Vanished. But where and how? Chris recently had knee surgery, so he couldn't have walked into the wilderness. Somehow, his car ended up in a park and ride lot four miles east of town. And I said he would never leave his car at the park and ride. And so I drove out there, and sure enough, there was Chris's car sitting there, and I looked in, and his things were in there. Inside the car was his knee brace, his water bottle. So then what did you do? I drove over to the police department to report him as a missing person. I saw this woman pull up in front of the police department, and I noticed the woman was crying, and she turned and looked at me and just kind of stood there crying like she needed help. Laura Frizzo was then the police chief of Iron River. I asked her, you know, who did Chris Reagan hang out with, and she did mention to me that she had heard a rumor that he was seeing some married woman at the workplace. So what happened next? I called the human resources director. She also had told me that she heard the rumor that Chris was um, having an affair with Kelly Cochran. So now two people, Chris's friend Terry and the HR director at his office, tell Chief Frizzo about the affair. So right now you have a missing man, you have a love triangle, and the man who's missing from the love triangle is the boyfriend, the, the one who was having the affair with the wife. Right, right. Everyone else thought it was what? We had a difference of opinion. The detective that was basically in charge had said over and over again that Chris Reagan disappeared because he wanted to, that he either killed himself or just disappeared. But Chief Frizzo's dogged determination convinced the other detectives. In Chris's car, they found a key clue pointing straight to Kelly. On the front passenger seat was a small piece of paper with directions written on it, and the directions were to Kelly Cochran's house. Bingo. Right. What's your gut telling you? My gut is telling me that we need to make contact with this Kelly Cochran. Cops and Michigan State Police converge on the house Kelly shared with her husband, Jason, and aren't exactly greeted with open arms. When they arrived there, the sergeant said they pulled up out front, and one of the troopers made mention to her that he saw someone standing in an upstairs window looking out. When they went to the door, they were greeted by a man, asked if Kelly was home. The man said, uh, no, she's not here, and she, she hasn't done anything wrong. Red flag number one. Jason lied. Kelly was there. She was the shadowy figure in the upstairs window. Shortly thereafter, Kelly came down and actually came to the door. So Kelly says she hadn't seen Chris for a couple days. She had no idea where he could be. Red flag number two, just a couple of days? At this point, it's been more than two weeks since anyone has seen or heard from Chris. Did she describe what kind of relationship she had with Chris? Well, she didn't go into detail, but she did admit they had a, a romantic relationship going on. Then what happens? Sergeant called me and said there's something wrong. She asked Kelly, would it be unusual for Chris to have left his vehicle at this park and ride? Kelly's response was yes, that would be unusual. He loved that car, past tense. Red flag number three. He loved that car. Yes. As opposed to saying he loves that car. Right. Those red flags were waving in the winds of suspicion. Cops asked Kelly and her husband, Jason, to come down to the station for an interview. Jason is in the hot seat first, and instead of talking about Chris, he oddly tells detectives if he sneezes, he can't walk. I have uh, like back issues. We used to call them slip discs. Now they call them bulging and deteriorating discs. So if I sneeze or move wrong, a lot of times I can't walk or can't stand up straight for months at a time. That's like, you have a person missing, why are you telling me about your back pain? He's trying to um, kind of change directions on what the focus is um, so that maybe they won't look at him as a possible suspect. Then it's Kelly's turn, and it's probably a good thing Jason wasn't in the room. I love Chris. She describes in graphic detail the animal passion in her secret love life. Well, and a lot of times we didn't actually make it to the bedroom. You could have been in the living room. Yeah. Do you remember where you were the last time? I think it was in the living room. 
And then Kelly said something that raised everyone's eyebrows. She claims Chris didn't come over for dinner, even though cops found the directions to her house in his car. On that last day, you went and brought dinner. Mm -hmm. And you brought what? Lasagna. So you brought a pan of lasagna? A plate. You brought a plate mm -hmm. with pieces of lasagna? Or what? Yes. You brought a plate of lasagna, and you made it garlic bread, and then cooked it in the oven? On the, I think it was a skillet. Her phone records and the communication with Chris Reagan indicate that she wasn't at his apartment at that time because they were communicating after that. And this surveillance video shows Kelly was at Chris's apartment two days after he seemingly vanished. Did you ever see her with the lasagna? No, and actually, um, that was the first thing I looked for when we did get the search warrant to go in uh, was any remnants of lasagna. No lasagna, no Chris, and no evidence to connect Kelly and Jason to his disappearance. Soon after, the couple moves back to Indiana. Chief Frizzo thinks they've killed Chris, and she wonders, could there be hidden clues still lurking in the house where they once lived? Next, the police chief tries an unconventional approach to finding Chris Regan. My friend did approach me and said, you know, I have this friend that she's like a psychic medium. Help from the other side. What did you see in your vision? The psychic takes Crime Watch Daily inside the house where she receives some chilling premonitions. A Michigan man is missing and just about every piece of evidence points to his secret lover and her husband having something to do with it. But police don't have enough evidence to prove it. Once again, here's Anna Garcia. Chris Regan stops at a gas station to fill his tank on the way to his lover Kelly Cochran's house. This surveillance video, the last known image of him alive. And police chief Laura Frizzo says she knows what happened to him. Kelly and her husband Jason killed him. My theory was that these two people were responsible for Chris Regan's disappearance. Definitely believed that they murdered him and that they were gonna try and get away with it. Get away they did quickly moving out of the house, leaving most everything behind and heading back to Indiana. And Chief Frizzo says either of them had a motive for murder. After all, Chris was Kelly's secret lover. But the chief doesn't have the proof to make a murder charge stick. Not just yet. When you finally went into the Cochran home, did you find anything? Yes, when we first went in, I thought that we hit the jackpot. What she says looks like blood. You could see some patterns on the ceiling above the door where uh, you entered the front of the house, identical to what it would look like if someone had assaulted someone with a weapon and, and the spray, you know, off onto the ceiling. Are you trying to say that the patterns on the ceiling look like someone had been shot in the head and everything went like this? Or actually more so if, if, if someone had um, been hit with an object, like a bat or whatever. What else did you find? We found a loaded 22 pistol uh, under the TV in the living room. But without a body, it's impossible to determine if that 22 was used to kill Chris. Chief Frizzo was stretched to the limit because her small force was investigating two unrelated homicides. She needed all the help she could get. So retired Michigan State Police Sergeant Michael Niger volunteered his help. So what is all of this here? What is this? This is all of the work, you know, that I did for um, Chief Frizzo on this case. And what Niger found would shift the investigation from a missing person into a murder case. Niger conducted a fresh search of Chris's car that was abandoned in the park and ride lot. Did you find anything? Yes, we, we found a lot of fibers, a lot of hair, uh, and, and we found a um, stocking cap. And there was a discussion about some leaves being seen trapped in the trunk lid. In other words, the trunk lid was closed on leaves, and I'd heard that, and I said, boy, that's important for what I do because we can decide, find out what kind of leaves those are, what kind of trees, and then we might know where, uh, potentially where the body was disposed of because, you know, it's, it's unusual to have leaves trapped, you know, in the trunk. Unusual because there are no trees outside Chris's apartment, but there are plenty of leafy trees outside Kelly's house. In fact, Niger says he and Chief Frizzo found that the GPS device in Chris's car proves he was at her house the day he went missing. The car had been there, yes. 
And Niger says he found something even more incriminating in Kelly's digital footprint. Sometimes people, when they're going to commit a crime, they will go and search stuff on Google, like you know, how to dispose of a body. The evidence I found on the computers were Google images, satellite imagery of the Caspian Pit. The Caspian Pit, an abandoned mine pit outside of town, filled with deep and murky water. Divers didn't find Chris, but they found something else, a burn barrel. So when they locate this um, burn barrel in the pit, um, they note that there's like what appears to be like a laundry cable wrapped around it um, or tied to it as well as a cement block. The Cochran's had a burn pit in, in their um, backyard and that burn barrel was missing. Do you know for sure that that was their burn barrel? No. And did any DNA evidence ever? No. Still not enough, so Chief Frizzo throws a Hail Mary. I mean, I would try anything. In an unconventional move, Chief Frizzo calls upon the spirit world to help. The chief hired a psychic medium who, in a Crime Watch Daily exclusive, takes us inside Kelly's house, where she says she received visions of violence. So this is where I got most of my feeling before the door was open. Um, and as I walked up here, immediately I saw all of this and I really didn't need to go any farther because I knew this is exactly what I had seen in my vision. Well, what did you see in your vision? Uh, the three steps, the tile on the floor was exactly the same. Um, and this is where I saw that Chris had been um, attacked. And did you know how he had been attacked or where he had been attacked? What I got was on that day that I came here, um, that he had walked up the steps, got up to the doorway, saw something was amiss. He turned around to leave, and as he was leaving, he got hit with something in the back of the head. I thought it might be a baseball bat. I didn't know if it was a gun or what. Laura asked me to walk up the stairs because she wanted me to come into this area, and I didn't need to because I said he never even made it there. Did you see this as an image? Did it come across as a voice? Like, how, how did you see this? It comes as like a knowing and the, um, as an image. So it's a combination. It's almost like I'm stepped back in the reality to that reality. I'm like a fly on the wall. But a psychic premonition isn't proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Now the case grows ice cold. With Kelly and Jason in Indiana, would cops ever find the answers they want? What did Kelly and her husband say to all of you when they all of a sudden showed up in Indiana? They said they had enough of being harassed by law enforcement over the death of Chris, them investigating them for it. But Kelly was still up to her old ways. Chief Frizzo says she was cheating on Jason, but this time with a woman. She had actually asked this woman that to be in a, a serious relationship with her. and you know, more meaningful relationship, and the girl said she would. Kelly was still married, but not for long. We're counting 911. He's bleeding barely. I don't know what's wrong. He's throwing up. He's sweating. She's about to become a widow. When the paramedics arrive, and what condition is Jason in? He's not breathing. He's, he's dead. And what's Kelly doing? Getting in their way, acting distraught, and overacting. Kelly claims her deeply depressed husband overdosed on heroin. But is this habitual liar just talking smack? Next, cops take a page out of a detective novel to trick Kelly into talking. I thought, oh man, she's never going to fall for that. Will the ploy work? Find out right after the break. Police are convinced that Kelly Cochran and her husband are a killer couple who murdered a missing Michigan man. But before they can put the cuffs on them, another person would end up dead. Anna Garcia is back with today's story, Love, Marriage, and Murder. Is Kelly Cochran the bisexual black widow? She sensationally claims her husband Jason died from a heroin overdose. But is she telling the truth? When you heard that Jason was dead, what did you think? I just couldn't believe it. I knew that Kelly killed him. Why do you think Kelly killed her husband? I think that she killed her husband because he was probably a liability for her. She was concerned that 
She was going to end up talking about things and she was going to get in trouble. Things like the unsolved disappearance of her lover, Chris Regan, in Iron River, Michigan. Now the suspicious death of Kelly's husband gives Chief Frizzo a fresh opportunity to get Kelly to talk about Chris. The chief asked Hobart, Indiana police detective Jeremy Ogden to speak to her. Right from the get-go, there was some kind of very strange um, like attraction or connection that she had to him or whatever it was, but she singled him out. That attraction seemed to surface in this cat and mouse game of texts between Kelly and Detective Ogden. Ever been to the West Coast? I was driving last night. Very interesting. Game on. No more play. Your move, Detective. See you soon. He was able to lead her to believe that he was sympathetic towards her and he believed her and he won her over. But Ogden hasn't been able to nab her yet. Kelly had fled to Kentucky. U.S. Marshals picked her up, and while in the local jail, she fashioned these shanks out of eyeglasses. Well, who do you think she was going to kill? Well, she made a comment that she was going to stab a female corrections officer, but changed her mind. You have the right to remain silent. In the interrogation room, Kelly says, let's make a deal. I'll talk for a price immunity from prosecution. Say I'm here to cooperate. However, I will not cooperate if there's any charges brought to me. I see how easy it is for you to get a search warrant. I see how it is for you pretty much to go through anything of people's stuff. Um, I think you can arrange something like that for me. No way would cops ever cut a deal like that. So Kelly shuts her mouth. Now, Chief Frizzo uses her new tool to pry it wide open. She was so attached to him is because he actually was able to do to her what she does to everyone else, and that is, you know, kind of trick her and manipulate her. So Ogden sets an almost unbelievable trap. He asks a friend of Jason's to make up a story that will freak Kelly out. His idea was, you know, I want you to make this phone call to Kelly, and I want you to tell her that you received in the mail this letter from Jason, and in this letter, there's a note that says, if something should happen to me, please mail this letter to the Iron River Police Department. She fell for it, and her initial responses were huge. She broke down and started crying and saying, please don't mail it. So the setup worked. It did, and that, and that enabled him, Detective Ogden, to move into the hundreds of hours of interviews he did with her. Now Kelly is back for a second round. I got two men dying there and two. I know that. Emotional, holding hands with the detective, Kelly finally comes clean about what happened to Jason. What did Kelly say? Um, that she had shot him up with a large dose of heroin to kind of subdue him a little bit, and she just put her, her hands over his uh, nose and mouth and suffocated him. Then comes the moment Chief Frizzo has been waiting nearly two years to hear. You watched him die, right? Look at me. Where did he shoot him in his body? In his head. Kelly describes how she lured Chris to her house. She and Jason ambushed Chris while he was naked. I know that. You two had sex upstairs before he got shot. And then somehow you end up back on the main level, right? OK, so you go back downstairs. Is Chris dressed? No. Are you dressed? And then Jason appears. And what happens then? What does he say to him? Kelly says, as she and Chris were still in a sexual embrace at the top of the stairs, Jason was lying in wait. His 22 rifle aimed straight at Chris's head. The bullet tears through his skull. You fell down the stairs with him? Death came in an instant, and it happened almost as the psychic said it did. He got hit with something in the back of the head. I felt that he had tried to get out the door or he had fallen out the door, something like that. Kelly then reveals the horrible way they disposed of Chris's body. Tell me what happened. 
What? Downsized it. How did he downsize it? Do you need to know of it? I do. I need to know it all. How did he cut him into pieces? A chisel. A what? A chisel. Like a big chisel. You know what I mean? A big chisel. Big wood chisel? Well, that doesn't make any sense, though. Kelly shifts her story and says Jason used an electric handsaw to chop him into pieces. So he completely dismembered Chris in the basement? Did you watch him? You got sick? You threw up? Kelly says they cut Chris up on plastic wrapping. They burned the plastic and the saw blade in a burn barrel and dumped the barrel in the mine pit. Then Jason drove Chris's car to the park and ride, and they scattered his mutilated body in the woods. And how did he take him there? With what? What did he do? Did he put him in the truck? Where? The confession complete, May I smoke? Kelly asked to smoke a last cigarette before she's taken to a cell. And while Detective Ogden is out of the room, she bizarrely falls out of her chair. Is she high or just tired? Cops aren't sure. Later, the admitted killer is put into handcuffs facing two counts of murder in two different states. I gotta tell you, I do not like being in this basement. Retired Michigan State Police Detective Michael Niger took me into Kelly's dungeon of death. This is where they took his body apart with a saw and then put him in garbage bags. The fact that you never found his blood in here, what do you think that plastic has to do with any of that? Well, the plastic is a you know impervious, impervious barrier, and uh, that would prevent. They would they would use that to you know prevent any surface in the basement from getting blood on it. No one still knows where the remains of Chris Regan are, but one person does, Kelly Cochran. Next, Kelly takes cops on a field trip to show where they dumped the body parts. I finally found you, you know. Plus, the question investigators all across the country want answered. Do you believe that Kelly is a serial killer? Now to the conclusion of today's story, love, marriage, and murder. For that, let's head back to our Anna Garcia. Chris, police say Kelly Cochran killed at least two people, but now they're wondering if there are more bodies out there. Kelly Cochran says she killed Chris Regan for love and killed her husband, Jason, for revenge. She said he was looking at her, right, as she was killing him. It didn't take long for him to stop breathing. She basically said within a minute. In a strange way, Kelly and Jason's diabolical plot to kill Chris was hatched 12 years earlier in a pact made in blood. When they got married, they made this pact that if one of them um, were to have an affair, that they had to kill the person that they had the affair with. There's no dispute Kelly is a serial cheater, but is she also a serial killer? Do you believe that Kelly is a serial killer? Yes. There were times she listed, like, as many as 21 people. Do you believe that? No. More realistically, probably five. There could be five more people out there that she has killed. Yes. In a recorded jailhouse phone call with her mother, Kelly hints there are bodies out there just waiting to be found. You didn't see this coming? No, I see this coming after it all happened, but I didn't know that you guys killed people before all this. But cops don't know if Kelly is even telling the truth, and they've never found the so-called trinket bag that many serial killers keep. Now Kelly, caged in a windowed cell, almost like Hannibal Lecter, is about to do one final good deed. This is just, you know, giving consent to go to your house with you. A deed that hardly makes up for a life of deadly decisions. We told one of the guys that it was a cannibal, that's why I was in a cage. Kelly tells cops 
She wants to give Chris a proper burial. So she takes cops on a wild field trip back to the scene of the crime. Hang on, you guys are crazy. You can shoot me if I do. They arrive at the spot in the woods where Kelly remembers dumping Chris's remains. What would the biggest piece of bone be that you, I mean, the torso. torso and that was here? Yeah. So then we should find ribs and I think that Generally, the skull should be the biggest, though. Kelly takes advantage of her day in the sun. Do you mind if I uh, open her door and take her out to smoke on the side? You can shoot me if I run. Okay. Stopping frequently to smoke. Can I smoke again? After a morning search, Kelly places her order for lunch. How do you? Cheese pizza? Just cheese? <laughs> there you Please. go. Cheese pizza. And maybe a soda. You heard right. The woman who used lasagna to lure her prey scarfs a slice and washes it down with a big gulp. You want pizza? I'm good. She's eating pizza. Iron County prosecutor Melissa Powell says she was stunned watching the video. She's having a good time. Yeah, she's so matter of fact about this. You're like, a horrible murder happened in this house and she's sitting there eating pizza and talking about it like it's the weather. Amazingly, the murder house is exactly the way Kelly and Jason left it after bolting for Indiana. Jason pulled him into here, and I, from what you were telling me, and like around in this area, and that's where he cut him out. In the cluttered kitchen, cops find a pair of forceps. Yeah, there you go. You're saying you use those? Yep. They're clean, though. Kelly says she used them to try and remove the bullet from Chris's skull. They were in the kitchen strainer, but it had not been washed for whatever reason. Thank God she wasn't tidy. Right. Kelly's memories of her evil act were accurate. In the field, cops found Chris's glasses, and then there it is. And I'm thinking, oh my God, it's it's a skull right there. Chris's skull with a big bullet hole. Just out in the open. You have to stop because I'm gonna cry. Why? It just was you know, I went over to the skull and I I got right down on my hands and knees and looked at him and just knew it was him. I mean, I was just like, oh, I finally found you, you know? You found Chris. At her murder trial, Kelly pinned the horrific crime on Jason, describing in gory detail what happened. When he cut him up, he had one of his hands so the last time he'd be waving to me, he was waving goodbye to me. And then prosecutor Melissa Powell painted a powerful and chilling image for the jury. Inside this bag, Chris's skull. It was enough to convict Kelly of first degree murder. She was sentenced to life in prison. What do you think was her motivation in telling you all this information that was ultimately used against her and, and it now has her incarcerated. It might have been part of her defense. I'm gonna blame this all on Jason. I'll show him where the body is, but I only know where this is because Jason forced me to do this. Crime Watch Daily wanted to talk to Kelly Cochran ourselves. She asked our producer to meet with her in prison and in our face-to-face -face meeting, she agreed to speak. Hi Kelly, it's Anna Garcia, how are you? But then she abruptly canceled our scheduled phone interview. She hung up. The hero of this investigation is Chief Frizzo, who in an odd way got caught up in Kelly's deadly love triangle, but with a good outcome. She's dating Detective Ogden, who can't speak since he is still investigating the killing of Kelly's husband, Jason. We started seeing each other, you know, um, during the investigation and uh, we've been we've been together since then. So are you and Detective Ogden getting married? Oh, uh, eventually we are. <laughs> <laughs> My guess is that Kelly Cochran is not too happy that you two are together. Oh, I'm sure not. But there is one woman whose hopes for happily ever after were snuffed out with the senseless murder of Chris Regan, his ex-girlfriend, Terry O'Donnell. But he's gone. We never had that opportunity to see if we could rebuild things or not. Kelly took that away. <laughs>